today's meeting. Before we start, just condolence speech. I call our secretary to proceed the meeting. So we the sad demise of a senior physician in Trichy, uh, Dr. Ganapati Sir, 81 year old physician who got his uh, PhD at this age uh, at NIT because of his research and he was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Governor. And I request our patent, Dr. Punaya Sir, to tell a few words about this senior physician. Thank you, sir. Sir, Ponneya, sir. Sir, pass one, sir. Unmute, Ponneya, sir. Sir, unmute, Ponneya. Sir, unmute, Ponneya. Ah, right. Hello. Ah. Am I audible? Audible, audible. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. G. Ganabadi usually likes to be called as Dr. G. G. He was very much senior to me at Madhuri Medical College. He worked a long years at headquarters hospital Dindigal, and he is very popular there. And he was closely associated with the famous Angulas people at Dindigal. In those days, assistant surgeons do not have any scope for promotion. They retire only as assistant surgeons. So the government at that time introduced a selection category assistant surgeon for specialties and posted some of the postgraduate assistant surgeons as specialists in their respective fields. From Trichy, Dr. V. Chandrasaran, who was surgeon here, was, he was promoted and posted to Ramanadavaram, but he didn't join. Dr. Kanabadi was promoted from Dindigal and he joined at Trichy. He worked for long years in Trichy, Headquarters Hospital. He was very popular since at that time for virtue of his post. He was in good rapport with all government officials, especially police officers and army people and other department people. He was having, though there is no official department of medicine, he created a special room for his consultation and a special ward for his attendance. My mostly he used to admit government officials and he looked after them. He was very cordial and uh, cooperative with all the assistant surgeon, never picked up any controversy with anybody. He many discussions and uh, chats will be very jovial. And the people used to like him very much for his uh, jokes and other, especially Dr. Ashraf and uh, Dr. Ganabadi, while they were talking, it will be an entertainment. He was a very active person. Be before this corona period, I used to see him walking in the Mali morning, in the Tilanaga roads. He used to stand and pray in all the small temples in the streets and then continue his walking such a pious person, and he was very active. He received this PhD just a year ago, shows his enthusiasm and positive mind. So to the last is a great one, not only to the family, but also the medical fraternity of the chief. We all pray almighty for the soul to rest in peace. Thank you. Silence. So we observe one minute silence for this departed soul.
Thanks, everyone. One one minute. I'm just trying to. So the minutes of previous meeting. Last month we had the May month meeting on 30th of May. Around 100 participants had attended. There is a problem in last month that many people were not able to log in. Uh, because we had only limited uh, participants license, but eventually we had a recording of this and we sent to most of the people who wanted that. And once the uh, TNMSC credit point was awarded, we had a detailed discussion on most uh, trending topic, oxygen a drug by the eminent professor, Dr. Geeta. Following that, we had an interesting and relaxation, relaxing discussion by Dr. Ismail breaks to the breaking news, implications to social media and its impact. Post lecture, we had a detailed discussion on the current and trending topics of uh, on COVID management. So those who want the registration, PN number is credit point, kindly put in the chat box your registration number, name, mobile number and email. The credit points will be added directly to your PNMSC credit account. There is no need for any certificate and other things. Uh, we are doing the recording of the discussion and it will be sent to you in the groups. Or if you want anything personally, you just uh, send the WhatsApp to this uh, number. So coming to the topic proper, the first topic is headache. A headache. It is a common headache to general practitioners. So whenever the patient comes to with the headache, it starts from a mild sinusitis headache to an intracranial space of coing lesion. So if you miss the intracranial space of coing lesion, it will be detrimental to the patient. So we should know how to evaluate, how to refer a patient uh, for a headache. So for this, the have person is uh, Dr. Balamurgan, sir. So many, he's a famous speaker in all the Epicon and Typicon, especially his movement disorder topics are very good because he will play a lot of videos and keep this discussion very lively. He is a pioneer in neurology care in Salem, founder and director of SIMS Neuro Team. He worked as a consultant and head of the department of leading hospitals in Salem. He was the first to start the IV thrombolysis for stroke and botulinum toxin therapy in Salem City. Exclusive epilepsy clinic, deep brain stimulation therapy for Parkinson's disease. Academic activities, he has contributed for many neurological chapters, published more than 20 papers with many international and national presentations, and more than 100 lectures and various medical meetings. He authored two books in Tamil, one on headache and the other on Parkinson's. He is an active member of APA Salem, has been on many prestigious postings in IAPA and IMA as Honorary Secretary, Tamil Nadu branch chairman of APA Salem and Honorary Secretary of IMA Salem. He is a renowned clinician, academician and a very good teacher. With this brief introduction, I hand over the podium to Dr. Balamurgan, sir. Sir, Balamurgan, sir. Yes, sir. Good sir. morning. Sir, good morning sir one all. minute, sir. Can I uh, share my slide, sir? Yes, sir. Sir, share for sir. You have to come out, sir. Somebody sharing the slide can come out. Yeah. and. Uh, you can unshare okay. for Okay, sir. Stop and test, sir. Is it visible, sir? My slides? Visible, sir. Put your blur dark, sir. Blur dark. Is that it? Put your slide or the size, put your reduce on the next time. Orange blur dark, sir. Whole thing blur dark. Oh, holding, sir. Holding. Probably then it must be some different reason, sir. Uh, same, sir. Sir, you fit to screen, but nothing, sir. Fit to screen, but nothing. Are they extend out there? Sir, Dr. E. Naresh Kumar. Is it okay, sir? No? Yeah, 
நல்ல ஷேர் ஆகு அப்படியா அப்படியா Am I audible? Audible. Audible. Screen is coming, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Sir, you can see your screen. 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 சொல்லுங்க good morning to you all at the outset i thank the organizer for giving me an opportunity to share some of the headache the patients that i had seen over the last 20 years uh, my special thanks to all my teachers tanjore medical college and nimhans and all the patients for allowing me to share their videos and their personal records epimetrichi konjam close to the heart now because studying at tanjore medical college she have been a sujatha and srirangam and sridangathu devadegal medical sujatha oda devadegal kedaiyad all tanjavur medical college students from trishi it's always close to the heart with uh, my thanks to all my batchmates in and around trishi my special thanks to ap senior leaders uh, dr professor ashraf dr gunashegar dr chaniyapan sir and the present president dr m shivashankaran the secretary dr l muthumani office bearers and members of ap I move on to the approach to headache uh, i have divided the topic into 20 20 minutes like initial 15 minutes will be on approach to acute headache then chronic headache and some rare headaches with uh, intermittent case discussions the first step in approaching headache in our opd will be most of the time they come to the opd but if the headache is of acute headache is less than 3 weeks generally they say less than 3 months but all practical purpose anything less than 3 weeks we can call as acute headache to make a diagnosis of migraine to say chronic at least more than 3 months is better. so acute headache by definition less than 3 months or most importantly less than 3 weeks any acute headache the approach has to be is there any red flags like signs and symptoms of raised icd like headache vomiting episodes of visual obstruction headache vomiting and visual disturbance can happen in migraine also chronic migraine or acute attack of migraine but the problem here is that the headache is mostly in the early morning or wakes the patient from sleep vomiting is projectile here and there will be transient visual obstruction rather than the visual aura in raised eye ct and if you have case of six no palsy which has a most often false localizing sign or papilledema so all these signs and symptoms indicate as they are all which is a raised icd any new onset seizures new onset neurological deficits fever or meningeal signs increasing severity and frequency of headache despite appropriate treatment recent onset undifferentiated headache for more than 8 weeks duration new onset headache in elderly i mean more than 50 years middle and elderly age new onset headache in immunosuppressed hiv patients or patients with malignancy take in pregnancy and postpartum and now recently post covid headache so these all the patients should be referred to emergency room for neuroimaging this headache is different they have red flags so they must be having intracranial lesions or severe pathology like it could be meningitis or sickle of post covid like mucor if no red flag signs like signs of raised icd or it's not a new onset headache then we can proceed with one more class is it thunder clap headache there is no signs of raised icd but the headache is thunder clap when to say it is a thunder clap sudden onset severe headache explosive unexpected headache by definition onset to peak severity is less than a minute that's the most important to say thunder clap headache if it is a thunder clap headache most likely you are dealing with aneurysm ruptured or partially ruptured or unruptured 
or it could be reversible cerebral vascular constriction syndrome. If it is a th thunderclap headache, your approach has to be again referring the patient to emergency room, emergency non-contrast CT brain. If it shows subarachnoid hemorrhage, yes, common cause subarachnoid hemorrhage. Your diagnosis, or if it shows some other abnormality, possible hematoma also can do that. Asmita is uh, scribbling in the things that can you hello. Madam Ragan. Yes, sir. Dr. Shivakumar, the screen is not shared. Oh, so I have no idea, sir. What's the screen is, is it shaky or uh, you're not able to see the screen, sir? Not only you can see the folders. Not able to see the screen. Yes, slides are less sir. In your case, three folders. Screen sharing phone on again. Screen, sir. Screen, there is a sir. Slides, there is a sir. No, no. Sir, you use funny, sir. Apple, sir. Dell, Dell, sir. Dell, sir. Dell, sir. Our point is that I think our point is usually the order. Sir, we're going to ask you to read sir. Keeper, sir. I'm going to ask presentation and email. Sir, I'm going to open money. Takes time, sir, because it has a lot of videos. For interest. Later, I can you can email me, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. It takes time that uh, what I'm doing is. While you talk, I can try opening it, sir. Sure, sir. Uh, you click on the share screen, you can click on the share screen, you can click on the share screen, you can share it, sir. Yes, sir, sure, sir. I was doing it for years to go. Now, the folder is there, sir. The screen is carrying it, sir. Now, you can see it, sir. Folder is there. उंगा, उंगा now we know the letters, but the screen is not clear. Sir, on the key... Where is it? There is a cursor on the key, sir. Near the slides are on the key. Yes, sir. That's why you're talking about it. But if you're doing it, you don't know the font, you don't know the images. I think it's a... I'm going to get it, sir. I'm going to get it, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. 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 But I think we'll start, sir. So we discussed about the red flag signs and thunderclap headache. And in emergency, if you suspect thunderclap headache, if the CT is normal, then we have to proceed with either LPCSF or MRA. 
So I prefer to go for MRA rather than LPCS of a second option because the chance of MRA picking up your suspected aneurysm or press or reversible ischemic or reversible cerebral vasoconstriction is high with MRA. So thunderclap headache is most often aneurysm ruptured or partially ruptured or it could be reversible cerebral vasoconstriction. So that entity has to be very clear if the headache is severe or the onset of, onset of peak is within minutes. No red flag signs, no thunderclap headache. Then look at this patient history. This 70 year old male, pain in the right side of the head and hospital region of two months duration. And his CT brain and MRI were normal. Probably two months duration of headache, tension headache, migraine, stress in the family. The pain was moderate to severe, not responding to NSAIDs. He had transient visual blurring of about a month's duration. So type changing the spectacles, going to the opticals, not to the ophthalmologist. Then ophthalmologist said that there is no significant ocular abnormality and referred to neurologist. There was no comorbid conditions, not a smoker or alcoholic, no COVID or COVID vaccination. So this is one entity where you have an acute or subacute headache with normal neuroimaging, including MRI. I think about primary headache, idiopathic intracranial hypertension or hypotension, sometimes subarachnoid hemorrhage may be missed in the CT, but very rare to miss in the MRI. Meningitis, unless you go for contrast, we can very easily miss. Similarly, vasculitis. So these are all the patients may be going between ophthalmology, ENT, and dental. Acute headache with a normal neuroimaging. So here the clue in the history are two. One 72-year male, first new onset headache, and transient visual blurring. So that's the important clue what he gave to me was jaw claudication so with the jaw claudication late that means elderly headache and you can see the tortuous blood vessels in the left side right side is not no prominent, but right side showed thrombus, right superficial temporal artery. So we took out the vessel and confirmed as giant cell arteritis. The biopsy showed destruction and reduplication of internal elastic lamina, marked adventitial fibrosis, transmural inflammation with giant cell infiltration of the vessels. So this patient was started on steroids. The jaw, jaw claudication disappeared on day two and headache started coming down within 24 hours and there was no recurrence of visual symptoms. We started the 60 milligram slowly with the effort. So here the message is when to suspect dental arteritis. Age more than 50, new onset headache, abrupt onset of visual disturbances, especially transient monocular visual loss. Migraine we have usually binocular. Jaw claudication. Unexplained fever, anemia, weight loss, asthenia, anorexia, fatigue, high ESR, and or high CR. So, acute headache, always think about these three important aspects of red flag signs of raised rice CT, thunderclap headache with severity, and giant cell arteritis in elderly people. Sometimes, the acute headache may mislead us from one department to another department or sometimes because of the imaging is normal. We may be finding difficult in making a proper diagnosis. I am showing these all the cases with the normal imaging. This 60 year old gentleman present to ER with acute tons of severe headache of the right frontal and orbital region of just two days with suspicion drop of one day. He also had red eye and watering of eye of one day duration, one sided. So right orbital pain. So no complaints of nasal block or vomiting. Cardiac patients on antiplatelets and intermittent nitrates. No past history of similar headache. So I thought that he was taking nitrate that produced headache. He was categorically clear and then no nitrate induced headache. There is no association with it. Just two days. Very severe. Then I thought it could be first attack of what we call as cluster headache or sunk trigeminal atelomic neuralgia. So his right people was mid-dilated. Not fully dilated, mildly dilated, not reacting to light. So you can see the right eye slightly red. Mm -hmm. 
The left side was normal. Okay, that's right. It looks like AC cornea. So, can I tell you? Tooth onset headache, especially eye pain with AC cornea and mid dilated people. Diagnosis are acute, angle closure glaucoma, and we refer to the ophthalmologist treated with the pilocarpine. You can see this patient again. The redness came down and the headache also came down. And the next day, they plan for uh, surgical so, yeah, The question is that acute headache with the right mildly dilated people made the general yeah. practitioner so think about yeah, it, yeah, structural yeah. problem, probably third of non and raised ACP. Why people is dilated in acute angle closure glaucoma? Increased intraocular pressure causes Irish ischemia, thereby causing dilation. So this is one mimic that should not be missed because when we start missing this probably third nerve, probably raised ICT, where we could not make up the CT and MRI, by another one or two days, the patient may lose his or her vision. That's most important or emergency situation in acute headache evaluation, especially patient with visual disturbance, mild dilated people, and hazy anterior chamber. This is another tricky patient, 50 year old lady, had acute severe right sided headache of two days duration associated with right eye pain with congestion, no precipitating factors. You can see here. In that lolly, so I thought that's again unilateral headache, right side, so ESR and everything was normal, and people were reacting to light. So I thought again it could be some form of cluster headache. We treated with oxygen, and patients said that some response was there. We were happy that we have made the first attack of cluster headache. So because of the right eye is more of a red and watering was there. So, anybody can guess this patient diagnosis? There was a clue here. After 24 hours, the patient came to me back saying that you were drugs. They started giving me side effect like rash. Then I realized it was nothing but herpes also involving B1 region. So, this is the first patient. So, if you carefully see, you can see here one dot which I missed. So the next day he came and I, you could see here and more and more rashes. That's one tricky thing that acute severe headache coming with one or two days duration and one side unless you visualize the vesicles, it may be difficult. Recently we had a C2 region which totally masked by the hair and uh, we thought that it could be something and then we had to find out on day two as a herpes. That is the one mimicker of acute severe headache, intolerable headache. So is it uh, third year uh, B student for exams, headache since a five days duration, severe started in the occipital region, now holocephalic, associated with vomiting, vaccinated just 10 days ago for COVID. Fundus showed disc edema and had a left six nerve palsy. So the, now the red flag signs here, and this is an acute headache, moderate to severe, but red flags are there. So it turned out to be extensive CVT. A lot of reports are with uh, some of the vaccines induced vascular events. So in post-COVID era, this is the kind of problem most of you people may be seeing more cases. Post-COVID or sometimes post-vaccination, cerebral venous thrombosis presenting as a headache or visual disturbance or raised intracranial features, CVT, sometimes IC occlusion, more number of 
IT application we see nowadays. And of course, the Mika, you are uh, more uh, well versed with the Mika diagnosis than a neurologist in the current period. Now, moving on to the next part of primary headaches. So far, we covered acute headache. I repeat, acute headache. We have talked about red flag signs for eyes racing, the severity and the character of the headache, thunderclap, and elderly people always gentle arteries to be ruled out. Not to miss this acute angle closure glaucoma. Primary headaches would be most often. I'm not going to discuss all the primary headaches. It's not possible. The three major primary headaches are migraine, chronic tension type of headache, and trigeminal autonomic sarcoidosis. Migraine is a symptom complex. That's the reason, because of the symptom variation, they go to general physician, to the pathologist, then ENT people, uh, they may go to the gastro. So they keep on wandering from one to other because of the multi symptom complex. Hypothalamic activation of late, the last 10 years has been documented, especially in the prodrome and postrome period. Yawning, polyuria, fatigue, mood changes, food craving. So these are the features of uh, prodromal or prodromal features that may cause confusion. Then if they have visual symptoms, visual aura, they may go to the ophthalmologist or they may have motor or sensory visual symptoms. Now we don't call basilar migraine, we call it a migraine with basilar symptoms. And uh, vertiginous migraine is the one thing that most often confuses vertigo and migraine is vertigo. So we'll discuss. When the migraine goes for chronic, they may go for allodynia, hypersensitivity to touch. So they may think that it is a psychological issue, but we call it as a chronic migraine. So it is, again, I repeat, it is a multi-symptom complex. It is not the aura and headache alone. Different pathophysiology over the last 50 years, it started with Elevation of blood vessels while the aura of migraine, the headache is due to dilatation, whereas the aura of migraine is due to vasoconstriction. Then, cortical spreading depression is linked to headache of migraine and the aura. Now, activation of trigeminal vascular system is the key. So, if you look at these important uh, features, aura starts, then the headache. Not the always the headache follows the aura. It may be during the ARA period or just at the end of the ARA. Whereas when you link, when you look at the perfusion studies, the hyperperfusion is not directly linked with ARA. When the person is having cerebral hyperperfusion, that time itself the headache starts. So that gives some idea about understanding it's not simple vasoconstriction, vasodilatation. Now the recent concept moving towards calcitonin gene-related peptide in migraine. CGRP is released into jugular venous system during migraine attack. It was a key factor. So CGRP infusion evokes migraine that confirmed that is the one of the important chemical to induce migraine. CGRP receptor antagonists effectively about a migraine attack. So the site of action is most commonly trigeminal ganglion and its connections. A migraine without aura, I make it simple to understand 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, like 5 attacks fulfilling the following criteria, like the duration is 4 hours to 3 days, unless the patient is on NSAIDs or triptans. So generally, it lasts from 4 hours to 3 days. And the yes, sir. Some noise is there. So headache has two or more than two of the following characters like unilateral location. Pulsatile quality, moderate or severe headache, aggravation, or causing avoidance of routine physical activity. And during headache, one or more than one of the following, like nausea and or vomiting, and phonophobia or osmophobia. So when a patient fulfills all these criteria, 
then you can be pretty sure it's a migraine. Hello. Is it visible, sir? Sir? The slide is visible? Uh, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. sir. No, it's not no. visible. Oh? I think it's probably happening. Well, again, problem. Is it visible, sir, now? Visible, not clear. Well, Your you folders are visible, sir, not the slides. Sir, you have a presentation on Google Drive, sir. You have a call for the call. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, is it visible now? No, sir. No, sir. I, I don't know, sir, how to do that because I have tried all the ways. It was going well somehow that uh, some problems sir, happened. Sir, Sir, one minute, sir. One minute, sir. One person will call you, sir. One minute, sir. I'll call my daughter. Hello. Ah, sure, madam. Oh, yes, a cake, sir. Okay, okay. Let me Gmail open, madam. The other punishment, minimum punishment. If I do it, it is interesting. Problem, Google one again it is asking. I am not using the Gmail. That's the problem. Yahoo mail that. 
இல்ல 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 நான் குரோம்ல போய்டுங்க அல்ல எனி டெஸ்க் னு டைப் பண்ணுங்க எனி டெஸ்க் சரி இன்டர்நெட் கனெக்ஷன் இருக்குது மேடம் ஒரு நிமிஷம் ஐ அம் வெரி சாரி and uh, if it's again troubling you can go with the next speaker so that i can come back to something possible very difficult for me uh, i tried all the ways because it's going well somehow the net connection and uh, i don't know why this is happening so are you able to see my folder sir now Sir, are you able to see my folder? Fold this, sir. Folder, the middle, or a blue or a triangle, rectangle, or this, sir. That's not great, sir. Folder, there, or a rectangle. Sir, Elena, you have time to take a moment, sir. Now, now, next week, next next week, it comes, sir. Next week, it comes. There's no other way. Okay. Sir. I'll try to send uh, all these things. Sure. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. You have, you have, you have, you have to coordinate, sir. Sure, sir. sure. because i don't want to disturb others all putu 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 sir oda slide oda enak anupa solunga email id tharen illa illa sir sir inda ivanga avangalta pesitirukanga sir ஒன்னு <laughs> 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 இது வந்து எனக்கு So, sorry for the inconvenience. We will go to the next topic uh, by Professor Dr. He is a well-known person, Dr. H.O.F. in Madhuri Medical College. To introduce him, I call upon his, uh, one of his students is here with us. Uh, he is Ashton Professor here and he is the Rectorate Committee member of our EPA, Dr. Prabhu. I call upon Dr. Prabhu to give a few words uh, to introduce Professor Natarajan, sir. Prabhu, unmute Dr. Prabhu. அன்மியூட்டன் <laughs> 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 fine afternoon i am taking the privilege of introduce our own chief our professor hod of medicine for madurai medical college and uh, he is a mentor for all of us he was academic in charge for our department and we, are, we all have a great pattern is class we started loving medicine because of him only ideal for all of us in taking dissertation topics and cmas and adding to that 
is a scientific committee chairman cme programs in our colleges and is a speaker in many state level national conferences in like capicon and cardia cardiology conclave and is a principal investigator in asthma trail for covid 19 he published many articles in many journals on his own interesting topic like the irna thorax hepatopulmonary syndrome and neurofibromas and he is also author for many chapters in ap update coming every year welcome sir thank you all sir morning sir sir screen share pannunga sir nadrajan sir yes screen sir Okay, pleasant good morning, all of you. Sir, my audible, sir. Okay, yes, sir, yes, sir, audible, sir. Okay, sir. Oh, okay, sir. Uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful opportunity, sir. It is a great relaxation for me coming out of COVID and discussing a very important academic topic because uh, we are all fed up with the uh, COVID work and COVID related uh, Zoom meetings. Oh, Now, I, once, once again, I thank our third uh, CAP for this wonderful opportunity and the introducer. Uh, for his kind words sir. and with that i'll uh, greetings from uh, my name meenakshi i'll proceed with the presentation today and this is a very important topic because uh, uh, we feel that uh, lft can help us to diagnose the related infection at any point of time at any point of time sometimes we not we may not be hitting the correct target but lft will help us probably this is the most important cause so with that introduction Okay. And now, why we are interested in liver function test in any tropical disease? Why not other organ function? So this is very important <clears throat> because uh, liver contains approximately one third of the reticular endothelial system. So you know, reticular endothelial system response to any infection is phenomenal. it undergoes hyperplasia hypertrophy it, uh, it produces gamma globulin and other globulins so that's the main factor why liver is affected in all infections it can uh, and because it's role as a filter uh, the liver is also exposed to many systemic infection uh, not to the it, sir can you mute others uh, because it's <laughs> Sir, sir, kindly unmute yourself, sir. Speaker. Okay. So now it's clear. So, as I told you already, liver contains approximately one third of reticular endothelial system, so it bears the brunt of the attack, and it uh, it acts also as the filter for most of the infection. The organism either reach through the systemic circulation through the hepatic artery or from the gut infection to the portal vein it reaches the liver liver acts as a filter for most of the microbial organism so they are going to elicit some response in the liver and so you ultimately are going to have some alteration in the liver function and the alteration can be either way so it can be liver can be a innocent bystander in that you will not have any manifestation of liver disease instead there will be an asymptomatic rise in the either bilirubin or amino transferases this is called as transaminases which unless we look for it we will not uh, we will not uh, know of it we will not be aware of it so it's called asymptomatic silent uh, innocent bystander affection of the liver or it can be worst in the form of acute liver failure acute liver cell failure that can happen uh, not only with hepatotropic virus even some non hepatotropic virus sometimes dengue all they are all, they are not actually non hepatotropic so even non hepatotropic oh, virus yeah. can produce liver failure so that is one way and of course all of us know chronic infections like hepatitis b hepatitis c uh, where in the liver bears the solo brunt of attack and then ends up in cirrhosis so today most i'll be discussing on this asymptomatic rise or acute liver failure cases and what are the different uh, types all of us know either whenever the liver is affected either it can be a, a hepatic pattern or a so called cholestatic pattern and uh, depending upon the infection it can be either cholestatic or hepatic pattern and whenever there is a cholestatic pattern you will have elevation of the 
<coughs> alkaline phosphatase as well as conjugated bilirubin. And it happens in intrahepatic cholestasis, extrahepatic cholestasis. And uh, but from our point of view, uh, any infiltrative granuloma, so called granulomatous hepatitis, produces a cholestatic pattern, which we will discuss later. And uh, there can be a hepatic injury pattern, wherein it's also called as transaminitis, wherein the elevation of the ALT and the AST, it is either because of direct hepatocellular injury or increase the permeability of the liver cell membrane. So uh, you will have uh, elevation of the SGOTPT, but usually not more than uh, 200 or 300. That is in uh, most of the infection. Only certain infection will have a phenomenal rise. And very rarely or sometimes occasionally we get an unconjugated bilirubin rise. That is, it can happen sometimes in malaria, which we will discuss, and some toxins. So all the three patterns can happen in, as far as liver is concerned, in tropical diseases, either a cholestatic pattern or a hepatic pattern, sometimes an unconjugated pre-hepatic pattern can also happen. Now, what is this uh, albumin? So though we call it as liver function test, my, ideally it is not liver function test, because uh, the, if you take the liver function, it is mainly synthesis of coagulation factor and synthesis of albumin. Only these two strictly come under liver function test. And uh, all the coagulation factors except the factor eight are synthesized in the liver. And uh, liver is the sole organ for albumin synthesis. So whenever the, but the half life of albumin is around 18 to 21 days. So it is not altered in acute liver cell failure. That can, in acute failure, it can be a normal or just a low albumin. But in chronic diseases, you'll, have, you'll be having a low albumin. And the albumin is called as a negative phase re reactant, a negative acute phase, like transferrin, transfutin. There are other negative acute phase reactants. Albumin is one negative acute phase reactant which comes down during infection, but it will take some time. And so ideally, uh, you will, your SGOT, SGPT, alkaline partners should not be categorized as liver function test. They can be categorized as biomarker, like cardiac biomarker. We don't call troponin A, CPK, CPKMB as uh, cardiac function test. They, they are called as cardiac biomarkers. So these, except albumin and prothrombin time, all the others should be taken as a injury marker for the liver. And what are the usual pattern of liver injury? Uh, so usually, in, uh, in whenever the liver is injured, there will be a definite rise in the ASC and the ALT. But uh, in the initial 24 to 48 hours, there will be a primary increase in the AST. Then after 48 hours, only you will have an increase in the AST. So you can even judge the infection and what time it has started. So the second is, and in the chronic phase, again, you'll be back. So, but uh, there's a subtle difference between AST and ALT. AST is not specific for liver. AST can be there from muscle, from intestine, from uh, lung, from kidney, from brain from uh, RBCs, from WBCs, so that it, it has got a multiple source. But ALT is very specific for liver. That's the first difference. And uh, ALT is mainly cytosolic, but a AST is both microsomal and cytosolic. And so whenever the micro uh, mitochondria, mitochondria is injured, as in cirrhosis, or as in, uh, as in uh, irracular poisoning, you'll have predominant AST. But when there are other sources of ASC also, that also should be taken into consideration before interpreting ASC, ALG levels. And now we'll go to the tropic pop, uh, pop, uh, tropical diseases and how the, your LFT is going to get altered in tropical diseases. And first of all, what is the definition of prop, tropics? Tropic not only induce tropical country, also induce subtropical country. So the, any region within Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn. They will come under tropical area. And we are more bothered about tropical diseases. This is These are the area where we'll have a heavy sun, and at the same time, heavy rainfall. So this combination is going to be a breeding place for most of the insect vectors, and also for bacteria and other organisms. So this is a breeding ground. So we have got more infectious disease in tropical countries. And I'm going to take you through through the alteration of liver function tests in bacterial condition, bacterial disease, parasite, viral, fungal toxins. And this is a huge list which I cannot go through uh, because this is a list showing how bacteria can affect the 
liver, mainly in the form of either as a mass granular matter hepatitis or as a mass lesion or as a cyst or as an abscess. So any bacteria, because as I mentioned the previous slides, will touch the liver at any point of time, either because of bacteremia, bacteremia and seedling in the liver or from the gut through the portal vein, sepsis, it will reach the liver. But the amount of insult to the liver is variable depending upon the bacteria. And I'll start with uh, a very important uh, spirochete infection, which is more common in our part of the country, that is leptospirosis. And how is the LFT in leptospirosis? And this is all of us know it is uh, transmitted through direct contact with rodent urine. And you've got uh, an ectric and ectric uh, phase. And whenever you've got a triad, patient has got uh, a jaundice, patient has got a hemorrhage, particularly congested conjunctiva and uh, thrombocytopenia, leukocytosis, and even uh, acute kidney injury. And I have to mention that without acute kidney injury, you should not diagnose leptospirosis. Leptospirosis this is a very important, though liver also is involved. The main mortality is because of acute kidney injury. And without any urinary, active urinary sediments, don't make a diagnosis of leptospirosis though the liver enzymes may be altered. Particularly, wheels, this is if you want to make, you should have this triad and uh, renal involvement is compulsory, is compulsory. And uh, LFT in this is a very peculiar LFT. That is, you will have, you'll be having isolated hyperbilirubinemia. That is a cholestatic pattern only. And the enzymes will be near normal or just increased. And this pattern, more or less, is diagnostic whenever the patient has got acute kidney injury and hemorrhage, thrombocytopenia, with a cholestatic pattern. And the main problem is uh, because of the capillary, immune complex mediated capillary damage, that will also lead to thrombocytopenia and tender hepatomegaly. And why there is an isolated cholestatic pattern? This is because of the so-called plugging of the bile canaliculus by uh, focal necrosis and the inflammatory exudates resulting in plugging. And so you'll have a cholestatic pattern. So to summarize the leptospirosis, you'll have a cholestatic pattern. Believe it can go even up to 80. Though textbook says we have seen up to 25, 30, not beyond that. Patient will have leukocytosis, thrombocytopenia, uh, bilirubin, uh, conjugate bilirubin, and uh, uh, subtle elevation of transaminases. And there will be an active urinary sediments such as cast, WVC cast or RVC, some active urinary sediments should be there and uh, the congested conjunctiva. With that, you can very well make a diagnosis of leptospirosis. Uh, though we still embark on uh, a MAT a microscopy occlumination test, uh, but the titer is different for different regions depending upon the intermissity. So even without that, when this you get a triad, you can very well make a diagnosis of leptospirosis and proceed further. And next important uh, infection we encounter now, uh, we see a more cases of salmonella type A, culture positive salmonella type A in this COVID era. I do not know why. And uh, all of us are through contaminated food and water. And hepatic involvement in salmonella type A. Uh, very important thing is the liver gets involved only the second week. And jaundice can happen only the second week, not in the first week. And if at all jaundice happens, it is mainly a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And what is the impact of liver involvement in typhoid? Whenever the jaundice in typhoid, it carries a bad prognosis. And the important thing is two complications, UGA bleed and ileal perforation are common. So whenever there's a jaundice, you anticipate these complications and you better start go for a MDR typhoid treatment like azithromycin or high-dose quinolones or uh, uh, high-dose deprioxone. So you anticipate, so that is very important in typhoid. Generally, uh, you don't get jaundice, but if at all you get jaundice the second week, it has got a bad prognosis and you anticipate this complication the second week and you proceed with the uh, MDR typhoid treatment. And so the manifestations can be just hepatitis and hepatomegaly, or sometimes we are seeing hepatic abscess, hepatic granuloma, hepatic granuloma. And the different mechanisms of uh, alter liver function. Patient can have hemolysis, particularly because in patient with thalassemia or G6 deficiency, ascending cholangitis, uh, salmonella liver abscess, suppurative 
pluvitis and cholecystitis. This is very important because in dysfunctioning gallbladder, dysfunctioning gallbladder, cholecystitis is common, cholelithiasis is common, and these people are prone to become carriers. Carriers, whenever they so ultimately they may have to have a six week course of amoxicillin, or ultimately they may end up in probably cholecystectomy also. So uh, you have to careful for LFT in enteric fever patient. And again, the, uh, the increase of uh, AS is more than 80. This is more in most of the conditions, will be uh, the OT will be more than 50. And the next common thing we encounter in our practice with mycobacterium tuberculosis and uh, it can involve the liver in very many ways and uh, it can be either a granulomatous hepatitis which is an isolated involvement of the liver or biliary disseminated tuberculosis wherein you will have hepatomegaly, spinomegaly, bone marrow will be involved. So without doing a liver biopsy or bone marrow biopsy, don't make a diagnosis of uh, uh, disseminated tuberculosis because these two organs should be involved to diagnose disseminated tuberculosis. And uh, granulomatous hepatitis, uh, we have seen some few cases because presenting as PUO, there will be no other symptom. And ultimately, I remember one, uh, one of uh, my colleague, our colleague who had PUO and uh, we are not able to pick up anything, uh, but PET showed there's an increased uptake of FDG in the liver. And uh, the LFT was classical of granulomatous hepatitis. Uh, that is the LFT of granulomatous hepatitis will have elevated alkaline phosphatase, normal bilirubin, and uh, low albumin. OTPT is near normal elevated. And ultimately, we did a liver biopsy. Whenever you do a liver biopsy in granulomatous hepatitis, you have to take definitely two samples. One sample should be in normal saline and send it for so-called gene expert plus studies. That is for AFB, for AFB culture, and if there's a growth to find out sensitivity. And another sample you send for histopathology to look for the caseating granulomas. And uh, granulomatous hepatitis itself is a separate topic, and uh, there are a empty number of causes: brucellosis, cryptosporidosis, cat scratch fever. But the common is common, so almost always it is uh, tuberculosis. But uh, you will confirm with the other investigations, and uh, so that is uh, one important presentation of tuberculosis as granulomatous hepatitis. The alteration will be mainly alkaline phosphatase elevated, low albumin, and near normal. Is the OTPT and localized form? We can have hepatic tuberculous abscess, which, which we have also seen so far in our uh, hospital setup. Tuberculoma uh, that is a, both of them we can confirm by aspiration or biopsy. And uh, I marked there is a third is the elevation of alkaline phosphate, which I already mentioned in granulomatous hepatitis. And sometimes the biliary system can be involved in the upset jaundice. This is a textbook quote, but we have not seen upset to jaundice uh, in uh, tuberculosis. Pain involvement is either as a disseminated biliary tuberculosis with subtle alteration or granulomatous hepatitis, one of the DD for PU. And uh, this is, uh, we are seeing day in and day out. Uh, I, our area is endemic for strep typhus, and you know, it's caused by Orient as usual, and uh, by it's transmitted by uh, chiggers. And what will be the mechanism of liver involvement in scrub typhus? It is mainly because of endothelial vasculitis. Vasculitis, and that's also there's a direct cytopenic liver damage. So vasculitis is a predominant thing because a scrub will also come under capillary leakage syndrome, uh, like uh, dengue, like leptospirosis. The, there is an immune mediated injury to the endothelium, so the capillary will start leaking, and so you can have uh, rashes and uh, of course scar and uh, in the lung involvement you can have uh, alveolar hemorrhage ARDS everything because of capillary leakage and the liver is invariably involved invariably involved in scrub and the pattern of liver injury is this is a commonest pattern that is they have elevated AAC ALT and subtle elevation of uh, ALP and bilirubin that's all so again AAC will be more than ALT as in any other infection, uh, the proportion of AAC will, is greater than the proportion of ALP. So that is predominantly hepatic injury pattern rather than a cholestatic pattern. And in the way, already patient has gonna establish cirrhosis. Uh, naturally, they'll have more uh, acute on chronic liver disease. So worsening hypoalbuminemia, hyperbilirubinemia. In general, 
whenever a scrub type of patient has got hyperbilirubinemia in addition to ot pt alteration the prognosis is bad so i uh, so just ot pt elevation the prognosis is reasonably good but in addition bilirubin gets getting elevated then the prognosis is supposed to be bad so you have to watch them carefully and this is uh, only for completion sake uh, bacteria to two uh, fewer zoonotic disease which we have not encountered uh, caused by coxella bernetti why i have included this is uh, this can mimic a viral hepatitis viral hepatitis uh, though it is transmitted from carcasses the liver involvement can mimic in that uh, it can have acute q fever and chronic q fever and a patient with severe hepatitis that bilirubin can go more than 20 and uh, otpt can get elevated to around 200 300 so the one way to differentiate viral hepatitis from this will be though the bilirubin is elevated the otpt will not be proportionately elevated you know in uh, viral hepatitis it will be in thousands so only few condition all of us know it will be more in thousands the viral hepatitis autoimmune hepatitis wilsonian uh, hepatitis ischemic hepatitis acute bile duct injury these are some few causes for elevation of otpt more than 15 times are normal or more than 1000 and so the bilirubin will be elevated but otpt will not be proportionally elevated and uh, think in terms of q fever but it is uh, diagnosed either by doing an antibody or the uh, liver biopsy which we don't embark nowadays a downnut uh, like granuloma in the liver biopsy is diagnostic of uh, q fever this is only for theoretical interest but one should be aware of it and this brucellosis yes once in a month at least we see a case of brucellosis unless we have got a high index of suspicion we don't diagnose brucellosis either can present with that so called ambulant fever or malta fever uh, or pellips in fever so uh, many patterns are there for brucellosis and uh, <clears throat> brucella militantis is supposed to be the worst affecting that uh, human beings and uh, hepatobacilli does happen in brucellosis and one clue which uh, given in textbook also esr will not be very much proportionally elevated a subtle elevation of esr some of uh, brucellosis doesn't elevate the esr much uh, and only 25% of cases will have elevation in the otpt level in general like al af acute liver failure is uncommon uh, but it is one of the dd for hepatic granuloma hepatic granuloma uh, so so granulomatous hepatitis can happen even with brucellosis and so ultimate so only uh, it's not only histopathology in addition we have to do a uh, take a sample in ns and send for tuberculosis rule out tuberculosis also when you can rule out uh, tuberculosis uh, uh, then you can think in terms of brucellosis as a next common cause for granulomatous hepatitis in our part of the country and this is a very very important topic which i like to share with all of you uh, dengue and liver so it's a break bone fever and all of us know it's by aids mosquito and the three different either mild dengue or dengue hemorrhagic or dengue shock and the lft is different in different <coughs> types of dengue fever and liver is the commonest organ involved in dengue when compared to all other organs the do muscle is involved uh, cpk will not be that much elevated so this is a commonest liver injury is either because of direct viral toxicity or dysregulated immunological injury and the primary target of the liver will be the hepatocytes and the kuffer cells and the heparin sulfate they play important role in the intrusion of the virus into the liver cell so they act as a carrier or a cargo uh, allowing the virus to enter into the liver cell and hepatomegaly so previously we used to teach that is you look for liver in dengue uh, if there is hepatomegaly and hyperbilirubinemia 2h third it should be horrible prognosis so generally liver is not palpable but if it is palpable and in addition if the patient bilirubin is elevated that carries a grave prognosis because bilirubin is not generally elevated only ast and alt are elevated even in the ast alt ast is more than alt and the source of ast in dengue is one, one is from muscles and because they have got some myalgia myositis and second is monocyte that has made because dengue is known for monocytosis so the source for ast in dengue is not only liver also muscle and monocyte so invariably they will have ot more than pt but bilirubin remains normal in so called mild dengue fever 
and when the go patient goes for dengue hemorrhagic fever or dengue shock then only the bleeding will get elevated and so it is because of probably an added element of ischemic hepatitis ischemic hepatitis where when the patient goes in for shock the liver bears one of the brunt of the attack and so he'll have elevated bilirubin also and one important thing is uh, though the patient can have elevated bilirubin otpt most of the cases inr remains normal inr remains normal this is one way to diagnose uh, uh, acute fulminant hepatitis uh, from acute fulminant uh, dengue fever wherein they will have all other features but the coagulation abnormalities are not very much marked in dengue encephalopathy so in dengue encephalopathy though the bilirubin is elevated otpt may be elevated it will, will be elevated uh, the pt inr is not very much prolonged as in acute fulminant hepatic failure this is an important marker to differentiate these two and liver damage is more common in females than males for some unknown reason and the histology in dengue if you have fatty changes destruction of buffer cells hepatocyte necrosis hyperplasia councilman bodies and uh, this will get to worsen with one of the complications that is uh, uh, hemophagocytic uh, syndrome and the area is involved most of the mid zone area is involved and sinusoidal congestion has also been observed in dengue and that is about dengue so in general in dengue you will have mild elevation ot pt ot more than pt to summarize and uh, bilirubin is near normal once it gets increased in, think of dengue hemorrhagic fever or dengue shock and prognosis is bad liver is not palpable if it is palpable again it indicates a bad prognostic indicator and the patient can develop ischemic hepatitis when the patient goes in for shock and next we're going to uh, hiv virus <clears throat> and liver is a second most common cause of mortality in hiv infected individuals it is either because of the virus or because of the antiretroviral therapy so one peculiar mechanism of this hiv is it can induce liver injury by direct interaction with liver cells and this infected cells they can cross talk with the uninfected cells and that can the spread of liver injury goes in that horizontal way so vertically they gets infected by the virus horizontally by the cross talk all the other cells are also infected and there's a, there is a acceleration of apoptosis process and these are the way by which uh, liver is involved in hiv starting from lipotoxicity systemic inflammation mitochondrial injury immune mediated injury toxic metabolite gut microbial transplantation nodular regenerative hyperplasia oxidative these are multi so liver bears a multi prong attack in hiv and you have this particular uh, gp120 uh, antigen it is going to activate the expression of il8 uh, interleukin 8 uh, which is one of the inflammatory marker and uh, <clears throat> multiple components of liver damage uh, is either by liver immune activation there's a decrease albumin level and uh, hiv it depletes uh, liver cd4 cells also not only total liver cd4 cells also depleted and uh, very many important thing is the kufer cells they promote steatosis so hyperplasia of the kufer cells they lead on to uh, non alcoholic steato hepatitis or uh, uh, steatosis and hiv infected hepatocytes can transfer the virus to susceptible cd4 cells there also and so ultimately the, the liver acts as a source for hiv protein it amplifies the hiv proteins and uh, uh, what is the pattern of involvement of course there is elevation of both alt and ast and there is a positive correlation between viral load and ast the more the ast the more the viral load and uh, after starting your heart therapy that can be a steep increase in the otpt rising to 2.5 times more than the baseline value and this is called as ali ali and this is more commonly associated with first line heart therapy so that also you should take not only the disease the drug first line heart therapy can also produce an increase in that and this is one more important thing uh, in hiv that's cholangiopathy this cases we have encountered at least two or three cases uh, this is because of second infection particularly cryptosporidium they have isolated elevation of alkaline phosphatase the alkaline phosphatase can be the tune of 
some thousand or thousand five hundred, but normal bilirubin, normal bilirubin. So in any HCV individual, isolated uh, alkaline phosphate is elevated with normal bilirubin near normal OTPT. Think in terms of HCV cholangiopathy. It is because of biliary obstruction and think of a common uh, the CD4 count is usually less than 100 and the cryptosporium is a culprit or it can be because of other organism also. And uh, uh, before going to the viral hepatitis proper, I forgot to mention about whenever you are uh, tuberculosis, uh, whenever you start an ATT, that can also affect the liver function test. And so you have to follow up with the LFT. And particularly whenever patient develops any alteration liver function test, when the patient is on ATT, stop all the ATT and assess the pattern. If it is isolated hyperbilirubinemia, it is because of rifampicin. If in addition to bilirubin and OTPT and alkaline phosphatase are elevated, it can be because of INH or pyrosamide. So you stop all the drugs. Then once the LFT becomes normal, first introduce rifampicin. Then you repeat LFT after one week. If there is no alteration, then you add the second drug INH. And never add pyrosinamide. Once a patient had hepatitis because of ATT, pyrosinamide should be permanently withdrawn. Don't add pyrosinamide at any point of time. So that is one follow-up for uh, ATT regimen. ATT regimen. And when the patient again and again develops, you go for a liver safe regimen. That is, uh, we call it as uh, 2She, 10He. That is uh, streptomycin, INH, ethambutal. For two months and 10 months, you give INH and ethambutal. Because no ATT regimen is complete without either rifampicin or INH. You should include either one of these two. But uh, the conventional regimen is 2She, 10He. And coming to hepatitis, this is a uh, basic difference between, this is produced mainly by your hepatotropic virus. Basic difference between liver involvement and the jaundice in hepatitis from other non-hepatotropic conditions or tropical disease. The clinical difference is the patient will have fever in only in the prodromal period in hepatitis. Once jaundice sets in, the fever will go off. So along with jaundice, they will never have fever. Usually, usual pattern. There are exceptions. Sometimes viral hepatitis A you can have. But patient is jaundice running temperature 100, 100, 100 unlikely to be viral hepatitis, because they will have fever only in the prodromal phase. So once it sets in, fever abates or fever subsides. Uh, so that is a basic difference. And you'll have first elevation of the, I'll show you the pattern. And the bilirubin is uh, increase in the conjugated bilirubin happens quite early, even when the total bilirubin is still normal. So normally we know only in uh, when the bilirubin is 1 milligram, 15% is only contributed by conjugate, remaining is unconjugate. But when there's an increase in the conjugate than the unconjugate, even though the bilirubin is normal, that is the earliest bilirubin change in hepatitis. And alkaline phosphatase will get increased because you have got a cholestatic pattern, cholestatic uh, phase, cholestatic phase. But very important in this cholestatic phase, one should at least, uh, some PGs are attending, I have highlighted that. Now there's a new bilirubin called as delta bilirubin or called bili protein. What is, this is in the cholestatic phase, you'll have a conjugated bilirubin. Normally conjugated bilirubin is water soluble. So it gets excreted in the urine, bile salt, bile pigment will be positive. But uh, when the cholestatic bilirubin is there for a prolonged period, it can also bind with the albumin. So this conjugate bilirubin bound with albumin is called as a delta bilirubin. So you will not have bile salt bile pigment in the urine. So this is one condition where in conjugate bilirubinemia with negative bile salt bile pigment in the urine. And that is prolonged cholestasis can happen in viral hepatitis, particularly it has been noticed in the hepatitis A, prolonged cholestatic phase. Uh, and serum iron, ferritin are raised and amino transferase Peak level is found just even before jaundice and albumin and globulin, they are not markedly changed because they are all acute phase reactant. Sir, excuse me, sir. Yes, yes, sir. sir can you just uh, stop the sharing and again share, sir, so that these uh, scribblings will go off, sir? Okay, sir. Okay. Stop sharing and again share, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. And this is an acute phase. 
they'll have market elevation of ACL to more than 15 times and normal more than 1,000. And the persistent increase in bilirubin and the prolongation of prothrombin time indicates severe liver injury. This is, uh, this is called pattern holds good for all uh, hepatitis, uh, viral hepatitis, hepatotrophic viral. And this is uh, hepatitis B virus, uh, which uh, only two points I, will, I would like to highlight on hepatitis B virus. Most of the time, it is chronic hepatitis B, and all of them will have some acute flare up. So, you diagnose acute flare up by doing an anti hepatitis B core antigen IgM titer. So, surface antigen positive, negative core antigen IgM means it is chronic. And uh, the current uh, jaundice is because of some other etiology. If both are positive, hepatitis B surface antigen positive as well as core antigen IgM is positive, it is because of current uh, hepatitis. The current can be acute or acute exacerbation of chronic. And one important thing which uh, has been quoted in textbook is alpha fetoprotein can be increased to even 5,000 even though the patient has got not <laughs> is not suffering from hepatosular carcinoma. This is one of the cause for elevation of alpha fetoprotein in hepatitis B. And in hepatitis C, uh, this is more or less uh, a similar pattern, but there is a modest increase in uh, AAC and ALT, not very marked, and never usually the uh, chronic ACV never exceeds five times upper limit. So it's we call it as transaminitis. Whenever anyone has got asymptomatic transaminitis, rule out hepatitis C. Hepatitis C. And hepatitis D. Uh, it is almost always a super infection. Only exception is it can directly infect the post transplant liver. All the, all the other time, it requires a base of hepatitis B. Hepatitis B. And uh, the most other treatment or uh, everything is because if you have to eradicate hepatitis B to have a control over hepatitis D. But one important point of the postgraduate is though it depends upon hepatitis B as a base. It can directly involve a post and liver. And these are all routine of, uh, and this is a pattern of hepatitis A, which is usually seen in children. First, they will have, you will have a fecal viral uh, excretion. Then the second thing to increase will be IgM, anti-HP. Then only you have ALT, then bilirubin, then IgG. And the bilirubin, uh, either it can be a, uh, conjugate bilirubin or uh, delta bilirubin can happen. And then uh, later, uh, the, vein, uh, the veining of the bilirubin will be there in the late phase. And hepatitis E, though it is uh, seen mainly uh, in children, it can also, it, when it affects a pregnant female, it tends to run a very moribund course. So this is about uh, <clears throat> yellow fever. Uh, passing mentioned, though we don't see because uh, uh, each Egypte is more engaged in transmitting uh, other uh, diseases than yellow fever in our part of the country. And we have got two, three phases in it, uh, wherein uh, the viral level peaks in the phase one, and there's a modest increase in transaminase, uh, but without jaundice. Again, transaminitis, and the increase is uh, mainly because of myocardial and skeletal muscle injury. And phase two, Mm, it's uh, when most of them they go to the recovery phase. If they don't enter the recovery phase, they go to the phase three, and they, where in the transaminase level can peak, and it is directly proportional to the severity of the disease. And herpes simplex virus, though it is not primarily a hepatotropic virus, a one or two cases of acute fulminant hepatic failure due to HSP we have seen, and uh, it is characterized by it can present as acute uh, liver failure. Transaminase level will be 100 to 1000 fold above normal. Such a huge uh, insult to the liver can happen. It is because of immune response, uh, uh, hypersensitive reaction in certain susceptible individuals, or can be because of enhanced virulent HSV, or because of large inoculum. Because generally, HSV doesn't produce acute uh, liver failure, but uh, at times it does produce. And these are the mechanisms because either I impaired immune response or virulent or a large inoculum producing a direct. Uh, and Epstein Barr virus, this uh, infectious monoclonal syndrome, uh, it can produce uh, either uh, acute hepatitis or chronic hepatitis like picture. You will have a <clears throat> elevation of aminotransferases, mostly two to three times the normal, not uh, very marked. Some can have elevated alkaline, but this is in general for all viral infection. 
for for all viral infection. Cytomegalovirus again a passing mention. Uh, the amino transferase do increase, but uh, not phenomenally increase. And, uh, and this is uh, again a very very important uh, disease which we see day in and day out. We get very many cases from down uh, Ramnad, Paramagudi, uh, presenting with uh, jaundice and fever. And so we have got uh, now. Uh, uh, five species, uh, including uh, Novelis and uh, Vivax uh, sympathetic species. And uh, the jaundice is multifactorial. This is so one type disease where we can have all the three types. Uh, so you can have uh, unconjugated bilirubin, we can have uh, hepatic bilirubin, as well as cholestatic bilirubin. So the unconjugated bilirubin is because of rupture of the <coughs> hemolysis of the RBC. And uh, 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 hepatic is because of rupture of the hepatocytes and uh, it, can, it can also produce <laughs> sir can can you move mute other sir? sir if i mute one person sir Sorry, if you unmute one to person, sir. Mute for me. Tell her in your way. Okay. Okay, sir. So all the three patterns can happen in malaria. And uh, <clears throat> very important thing is in severe malaria, not only hemolysis, not only hepatic injury. We have got three phenomena called a cyto adherence, agglutination, prostate formation. All these things they are going to cause agglutination and uh, uh, clogging of the arterioles and resulting in multi-organ dysfunction. And so you are going to have ischemic insult to the uh, to the liver also. So malarial hepatopathy is characterized by increased bilirubin, and uh, we have seen bilirubin of forty. When the very important thing about this malarial hepatopathy bilirubin is uh, the forty. Once you start treatment with the artesunate, next day it will become twenty, third day it will become ten, and fourth day the jaundice will totally disappear. So there will be a dramatic, drastic uh, decline in the bilirubin once you initiate the act that is uh, artemisinin combination therapy. Uh, the DAC can also happen. And even in malarial uh, encumber, when the patient presents the cerebral malaria, uh, the, usually the cerebral malaria and uh, jaundice, they don't go hand in hand much. So that is one way to differentiate uh, hepatic encumber, uh, uh, hepatic encumber. But even then, sometimes we do have but important uh, discriminating fact, uh, factor will be your uh, INR will be near normal. Near normal, only antithromic 3 will be reduced in uh, malarial uh, hepatopathy. And the enzymes are not markedly elevated, only bilirubin will be elevated. And INR is usually normal, usually normal. This is one way to differentiate uh, acute pulmonary hepatic failure. And that is about uh, malaria and, and uh, amoebic liver abscess. This also we see frequently, uh, particularly in alcoholics. Uh, and non alcoholic very rare to have amoebic liver abscess. And the usual pattern will be uh, because they can have liver enzymes, usually around three times are normal. They can have some bilirubinemia. Uh, alkaline phosphatase can be elevated. And the mechanism is either because of pressure on the hepatic ducts or direct parenchyme involvement, we call it as amoebic hepatitis and uh, cholestasis or vascular injury. These are different mechanisms, but generally we get a bilirubin of around two, three, not more than that. Subtle elevation, once you drain the abscess, uh, uh, there's a improvement. So is again, uh, our part of the country, we don't see though common in Bihar and other uh, central uh, India. Uh, and we are, uh, the chronic cystosome can produce pipes and fibrosis and uh, uh, pre sinusoidal portal hypertension. But uh, in general, it, if in acute cystosome, so called Katayama fever, you'll have elevated AST. And one important thing is gamma glutamate transcriptidase. Though it is a marker for alcoholism, that gets elevated in cystosomiasis. And hydatid cyst, uh, the liver is a common organ, organ involved in hydatid cyst. Uh, and uh, this can produce uh, alteration of the liver function test, uh, either because of uh, the pressure of the cyst, or it, it, this can lead to a polystatic jaundice, or pressure into the hepatic veins, uh, and that can also produce a Bacchiari syndrome-like presentation, 
or say it can be second invented by biogenic organism and you can have a picture of biogenic liver abscess. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the total value is elevated and the ALT is elevated and there is also elevation of AST. And so in general, uh, all the parameters are altered. Uh, most of them is a polystatic pattern. And the candida is almost always produces uh, both involvement of uh, liver and uh, spleen in a sequential way. And you'll have elevated uh, alkaline phosphatase and a modest increase in serum amino. So here uh, the polystatic pattern, more of uh, alkaline phosphatase. This is one more fungal infection. Now though mucor mycosis, uh, now currently we've got one uh, liver involvement in mucor. This is cyst. Huh? Sir, I'm, I'm audible, sir. Sir, yes, sir. Audible, sir. Audible, sir. Okay. And so, and these patients present with hepatomegaly, fever, cholestasis, and progressive jaundice. These are all uh, some rare uh, situations. Uh, and the severity of uh, the uh, cholestasis is proportional to the involvement of histoplasmosis. Transamidase are usually high in the hundreds, 150, some not, but the alkaline phosphatase, so one important thing for to note, it can go more than 2000 in histoplasmosis. And to, in the fact, and I, I will be failing if I don't tell about alcohol, though in tropical countries, uh, you now there's a uh, increase uh, and uh, abuse of alcohol. So, and, and, uh, and uh, this alcohol, all of us know, it is supposed to produce AST more than ALT, the ratio where it is more than three, it is diagnostic, more than two, suspicion. And alkaline phosphatase can be elevated, but the important thing is gamma glutamate transferase will be elevated at least for 15 days after the last bit. That is one important investigation uh, from uh, probably a judicial point of view, whether the patient has consumed alcohol recently or not. And the carbohydrate deficient transferrin is always elevated depending upon the consumption. These two are important thing in diagnosing acute alcohol binge. And the serum IgA and IgG is modestly elevated. And why AST is more elevated? There are three proposed mechanisms. One is because of deficiency of pyridoxal phosphate. Second is mitochondrial damage directly because the AST is supposed to be a mitochondrial enzyme and decreased production of ALT from a chronically damaged liver. And these are all the routine, which I can. And this is uh, maybe the last slide uh, that is we frequently encounter what is called as a rat killer paste poisoning. So we have got uh, a rat killer cake, rat killer powder, rat killer paste. So this is paste is supposed to be even one milligram of uh, yellow phosphorus. In the, that is a paste, small paste. It is injurious to liver and we are, they come walking to the hospital but uh, to a th third or fourth day, they start deteriorating and uh, eventually the mortality rate is very high. And the pattern uh, which usually seen is in the initial phase, you'll have what is called as a hemolytic pattern. You can have a mild uh, elevation in the unconjugate bilirubin. Then because it's a mitochondrial toxin, you'll have AST more than ALT. So unlike other infections, because uh, the patient will hide the fact of consuming yellow phosphorus. As uh, such cases we have seen, and we will make a diagnosis of viral hepatitis. But the important point will be in viral hepatitis, ALT will be more than AST, but in yellow phosphorus poisoning, AST will be more than ALT because it is a mitochondrial toxin. And uh, then we will take the history and we have found out at least some five or six cases who, uh, who are who have hidden the fact of consuming yellow phosphorus. And with that, I again thank the organizer for giving me this wonderful opportunity for recapitulating uh, the liver involvement in various topical diseases and interpretation of the results. And one just a final word about typhoid, which I forgot to mention is uh, we had one case of typhoid fever where the OT was around 2,500. Then we did the CPK, it was 10,000. Then we made a diagnosis of typhoid myositis. So patient was presenting with the acute abdomen and it was because of the uh, myositis involving the rectus abdominis muscle. 
uh, uh, patient, it was not actually perforation. It was not perforation. So one case of typhoid myositis where an OTPT was more than 1,000. Ultimately, we concluded by doing a CPK test, which was 10,000. And we didn't open the abdomen at all. With the MDR typhoid treatment, everything subsided. So that's uh, I want to mention as one of our experience with typhoid, where an OTP you can go to 2,000. Then you could take CPK for typhoid myositis. Again, thank you very much for the patient hearing. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. That was a very excellent discussion, sir. Excellent, and I love it. Every word you uttered uh, is an important uh, clinical point for us. Um, sir, uh, Dr. Balamurugan, sir, I think uh, his PowerPoint is not, uh, uh, not getting downloaded. Uh, 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 PowerPoint? Uh, uh, sir. Uh, PowerPoint on the IDAC is open. I am 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 open. Once the talks are over, we'll take the question. Yeah, yeah. Till, till, the, till the time he is getting ready, we can ask the question. Sir, Ujay okay, Master, please. Muthumani. Uh, sir, Ujay Master. Uh -huh. I want to ask questions in the liver. Okay, Hello? okay, okay. Shall I ask? Or, uh... ah, okay, okay. A slight share of you, you, you can ask. Sir, Is it possible, sir? I have shared my slide. Files there, the sir, the slides there, the Mutumis, sir. Files, files, not a three, the slide three, the unload of files, the unload of laptop three, the other level of files along the three. Folder, folder three is folders. Please, please, please. Open up. Hey, sir, sir, sir. Sir, the last attempt. Sir, sir. 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 Sir, uh, we, we have to postpone and we have to make it on uh, oh, the sir, next sure. meeting. I'll be available. I'll be available. Right. Because uh, it is a very important topic, sir, because uh, we, everybody is waiting for that only. Um, on the tuck -tuck, uh, we cannot finish it off and uh, for name's sake, we cannot go like that, sir. Yes, if, okay. if not there, we'll just postpone it to next we'll month. Postpone sir. it some other day. I'll be available. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I again try. Okay, sir. File there, is, sir. Files open. I oh, file sir is there. File sir is there. Open. It's open. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Open. Hello, sir. Okay, sir. Next time, we will do it again. Sure, sir. That's a Next month, we will sir. Sure, sir. So, we, we, we can take sir, one question. Sir, just one second. No, no. Doctor, uh, we can take some questions, both on headache and uh, jaundice. Uh, we, can, we can go for the discussion. Sure, so, sir. anybody having the questions, you can ask. To so both the speakers, both Malamurgan, sir, and Natarajan, sir, you can ask questions for both the speakers. And uh, you can uh, type it in the chat box also.
sir one question for uh, natarajan sir sir natarajan sir i am audible sir yeah yeah you are muthumani kekkudu sir what is the level of liver enzymes in congested liver due to congestive cardiac failure okay so this i, I failed to touch on it sir but it mainly produces isolated hyperbilirubinemia and uh, we have seen cases up to 2025 but textbook says 40 mg of bilirubin is upper limit for congestive heart failure and alkaline possibility is elevated and unless the patient is in shock enzyme the otpt will be only in less than 100 when the patient goes for shock ischemic hepatitis otpt will get elevated so in just chronic congestive cardiac failure with huge hepatomegaly bilirubin can go up to 40 alkaline possibility will be elevated otpt will be near normal again once failure is treated bilirubin comes down drastically okay sir is sir is it uh, mandatory to do lft in fasting uh, the lft in fasting will not have any affection of the enzyme sir but bilirubin there is a change particularly if you suspect gilbert syndrome there will be a difference between fasting and postpartum in gilbert syndrome you have fasting hyperbilirubinemia sorry uh, fasting will aggravate yes fasting once you take glucose and then you uh, repeat bilirubin it will become it uh, level will come down so unless you suspect gilbert uh, there is not much of difference in other conditions as we regard to bilirubin and uh, transaminases gilbert definitely you have to do fasting as well as uh, after undergram of glucose that's one of the diagnostic uh, criteria for diagnosing gilbert okay sir thank you sir sir one question to balamurugan sir yes, sir. Uh, sir how to manage a patient with post covid headache with normal ct and mri if it is a viral post asthenia then we can give simple analgesics sir but again post viral headache if, even if it is a, a normal imaging two things we have to be very clear what practically what we see that we may be missing mucor mycosis that's one thing it, they may have a frontal or ostical headache after a week if you ask them to come back they will have obvious eye signs that's one thing second venous thrombosis even the apps we can miss but that's the reason don't give my much weightage for the normal ct or normal mri we have to go for mr venogram these are the two common things that we should not miss because recently at, at present i have a patient of jugular vein thrombosis which is a normal ct normal mri and mre then after three days when we did an mri repeat mri it showed a venous thrombosis so we commonly see these two things that should not be missed and the post hypoxic headache they respond very well to the treatment of oxygenation sir. okay sir thank you sir sir uh, natarajan sir lft alteration two percent sir one is lft alteration in opc poisoning and another question is lft alteration in uh, sepsis and covid so lft alteration in opc poisoning uh there is not uh, a strict pattern sir strict pattern of lft alteration in opc poison as far as i know uh, there can be subtle alteration in the transaminases and alkaline phosphatase level but very important thing is uh, your choline stress is synthesized uh, in the liver and so the, for time to take for regeneration will take 24 to uh, 24 to 36 hours so that is the one alteration uh, as all of us know but there is no pattern of uh, lft alteration in organophosphorus uh, poisoning there is no definite pattern and in sepsis yes uh, sepsis uh, uh, when the patient presents with shock it is ischemic hepatitis pattern that is uh, otpt will be grossly elevated uh, with the mild elevation in bilirubin uh, the patient presents with shock when the patient is not in shock not in shock again the same pattern of uh, uh, modest elevation of otpt <laughs> ഹെപ്പറ്റൈറ്റിസ് പാറ്റ and so you have a gross elevation of otpt and with a mild elevation of bilirubin and once the shock improves the otpt levels comes down drastically so that is 
managing the shock, a septic shock, there's an improvement in the OTP team component. Thank you, sir. Sir, Dr. Balamurgan, sir, uh, yes, sir. you said uh, CVT after COVID vaccination, sir. So what yes, is sir. that, sir? Whether it is possible to get a CVT after vaccination, kindly elaborate something about that, sir. Yes, sir. The recent article, they have documented nearly about 13 cases from US. Uh, last week, that the article has been published. And then it is surprising they have increased number of uh, venous thrombosis post-vaccination with AstraZeneca uh, but I'm, uh, we had to be very clear before uh, saying that it is only vaccine related. So is it vaccine related or is it uh, virus related or is it, uh, it can't be the more percentage of CVT that we started seeing now. So it's not simply, uh, we can see that we started seeing more CVT, but more CVT is in the pandemic, most likely a virus trigger or vaccine trigger. <laughs> Sir, is it mandatory to have a OTPT, a OT more than PT in alcoholic hepatitis, or is it possible that alcoholic hepatitis can present with increased uh, ALT, sir? So, as I showed in the previous slides, there are three reasons why always OT is more than PT in alcoholic. Whenever the PT is more than OT, you think of some other super added cause like hepatitis A, E, and so it is it's mandatory this ratio is a must to diagnose and so whenever the pt is more than ot in an alcoholic you think of a different super added etiology rather than alcoholism alone Okay, sir. If anybody has some questions, please you can please unmute yourself and you can ask. Doctor Muthumani, Doctor Raj, sir, from here. Hello. Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Sir, uh, sir. This is a doubt to Doctor Natarajan, sir. Uh, sir, I am a pulmonologist and also a former district TB officer at Eno. Retired. Sir, we are starting ATT for a lot of patients without uh, liver function, but most of the time during ATT, the patient will have a transient elevation of liver and such. But unless there is a clinical heart disease, is it necessary to stop the ATP? Say, am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you are audible, sir. Oh. I'll just uh, try to clarify your question, sir. So, whenever the patient is on ATT and whenever the patient becomes symptomatic, so we divide the yes. LFT into two types, sir. One is upper limit of normal, we consider three, three times and five times. When the patient is symptomatic and if the ALT, AST is more than three times a normal, you have to stop. If it is less than three times, you need not stop. When the patient is asymptomatic, that is no gastritis, no vomiting, you can allow up to an elevation of five times a normal. When it crosses five times a normal, even though the patient is asymptomatic, you have to stop. So that is a cutoff. Three times a normal, five times. Symptomatic, three times, you have to stop. Asymptomatic, five times, you have to stop. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Sir, any other recent uh, prophylactic treatment for migraine? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, the big finds that what we use is propolis. The recent thing that what they are using is uh, now we have uh, calcium, calcium and gene related peptides. So, those are the things that, especially monoclonal antibodies, has come that can be given once in a month preparation. And we have diatoms, triptans. So triptan is 5-hydroxy triptan. That's on the 5-hydroxy triptan. So we call it triptan. So some of the triptans are not selective. So they have gone for a selective 5-HT1F. So what we call is diatoms. So diatoms for treatment like triptans. But few diatoms has been approved for a chronic treatment also. It has not come uh, to our uh, India, Indian uh, things. Uh, 20, 2019, they approved in FDA. And probably the pharma company will be bombarding you after the COVID, I think, with Daytons and g -pans. So Daytons is the new drugs, which is used and some of the drugs will be used for chronic also. It is acting on the 5 f receptors. And the monoclonal antibodies against calcium channel receptors is very costly, something around 5 lakhs per uh, year. So once in a once in three months, one in once in a month injections are available. 
prophylactic in the newer armamentarium in the treatment of chronic migraine as a prophylaxis Is routine use of propranolol and other beta blockers? Yes, sir. It's a standard, standard, uh, well proved, documented. Still, highest grade of evidence is there with our uh, beta blockers, especially propranolol. You can start with 10 to 20 milligram. You can increase up to 80 to 120 milligram. But the side effects properly have to be careful, especially weight gain. That's the one thing that's bothering. If the weight gain is bothering, then you have, we have only one option for. Pyramid because most the, the, I, we always call the big five the calcium channel blockers, chlorazine again, weight gain, sodium alpate weight gain, your propanol beta blockers, weight gain, and the tricyclic antidepressants. And you go for a higher dose again, weight gain. So, the only index which may not cause weight gain may cause weight loss also is uh, pyramid. Importance. What is the main triggering factor, sir? Migraine. Highly variable. Uh, in Indian population, fasting, head bath, and smell, uh, smoke smell, and these are the common triggering factors. So I always say that it is not one triggering factor. Uh, everything has a sub threshold when everything joins together. Typical So they get up in the early morning, sleep disturbance, head bath, and travel. Sunlight exposure. Sunlight exposure. Uh, yes, sunlight exposure. And photophobia and phonophobia. Phonophobia because loud noise in the marriage hall. All those things terribly contribute to that. So individually, it may not be contributing headache, but when they have a combined precipitating factors, there's more uh, dangerous, more reason for causing this. TV, TV LED light. That also may trigger. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any retinal stimulation can produce any form. So, because head bath produces the migraine, precipitates the migraine, uh, especially in Indian population, uh, Professor Ravi Shankar has described a head bath triggered uh, migraine. So, that's a common myth that people think that because head bath produces the migraine, they think that headache, they think that it is a sinus headache. So, most of the time, migraine. Treated as a sinus headache because the attendants or the patient think that every time they take head bath, the, the headache starts. I'm not sure. so. any, any other questions? Anybody want to ask? Good morning. Okay. Okay. Uh, there money, are no money, questions. Ah, go yes, to the chat box. Mutsumani, go through the chat box. There are a lot of questions are there. Uh, and I want to tell one thing, sir. The, the nearly it's a good response. There's more than 222 participants in AP meet. I think this is the first time we are crossing more than 200 members. Salute to President and Secretary and Treasurer. Thank you, thank sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Because, uh, Sir, mechanism of action of monoclonal antibody. This will be your last question, sir, because uh, short of time. Monoclonal they act, antibody. They act, they act on the uh, gene, calcium gene related, calcitonin gene, calcitonin related peptide, sir. They act, okay. act on, as an antagonist. Okay, sir. Okay. Sir, only one last antagonist. Yes, sir. Okay. One, one last question to Dr. Natarajan, sir. Uh, after statin, what is the effect of liver enzymes, sir? Which is most affected? Uh, again, statin is going to produce some transaminitis. That is, uh, that uh, OT will be more than PT. But uh, that is not a contraindication to stop unless it is you know, hugely increased. So, uh, but better if you are in doubt, you can switch over to a, a hydrophilic uh, statin. Uh, that is the issue, but uh, because basic, basically patients will have NASH. Non alcoholic steroid hepatitis. Whenever you are using certain already patients will have NASH, they will have already some deranged LFT, but that deranged LFT is not a contraindication of statin. And once you statin, there can be some alteration in the LFT, mainly OT can be more than PT. That is not a contraindication unless you probably again it increases for, to more than five times the normal. Otherwise, you can continue, but mainly you have to monitor. That's all. 
but uh, there are certain idiosyncratic or uh, certain people who are very prone for statin toxin that's called as autoimmune uh, idiosyncratic reaction to statin they can develop severe myositis severe hepatitis but that is very hardly one in a million do develop otherwise uh, subtle elevation is not a contraindication you need not stop you can continue statin okay sir uh, sir thank you sir thank you dr natarajan sir and dr malavarman sir we are extremely sorry for the headache topic sir but definitely we will be having it in the next month sir we, we yes, need sir. one full session for that sir uh, yes, we will have a trial run and we'll uh, make it after that sir and uh, i i call upon the treasurer dr sakthivel to give the vote of thanks a very good evening to good afternoon to one and all uh, uh, thanks for that wonderful uh, treat of uh, both from uh, balamurugan sir uh, and uh, from the professor from uh, madurai medical college Uh, uh sorry for the glitches we had of course uh, we will do the needful next time and uh, thanks to all the uh, doctors for having logged in and patiently listened to this wonderful lecture we had more than 290 plus uh, participants yes. uh, and i i thank uh, the the patrons the founding members uh, the president chairperson uh, secretary uh, all those who have helped in making this uh, event a very eventful one thank you thanks once again have a wonderful sunday thank you thank you Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, we are recording this session. Thank the you. session the recordings will be given shortly. Thanks, sir. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Sir, what is the issue?